What's up, everybody? Good to be back. I hope you guys are doing well. I hope you guys are in a good place right now. This is Giants Amongst Us, where we share in the unique human experience and where each and every time you check in, you're going to hear real stories told by real people, people just like yourself. So if this is your first time tuning in, these connections that are made, these conversations that are had are testimonies and examples of the resilient human spirit. It points to what change looks like, what taking accountability and responsibility for one's experience and actions looks like. And today, Clarence joins us and he's got a story to tell. This young man, who at an early age and pretty much for his whole life suffered from a host of health conditions, autistic. And at the time of the recording, he was in the process of getting an official diagnosis, ADHD, facial blindness, Tourette's, and Fantasia. All of these disabilities may have put him at a disadvantage, but you can't help but be inspired after listening to how he worked out ways to better himself in areas where he lacked and fell short. Clarence also suffered from a lot of abuse coming up and that led to depression and eventual weight gain to the point where he was weighing at one point over 400 pounds laying in bed sleeping about 17, 18 hours out of the day. How did he come out of it? What changed in him? He's gonna share some of that with us today. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, this is Clarence and his story. Probably the biggest problem I faced whenever I was a kid was sensory sensitivities, which is something a lot of autistic people struggle with. Whenever I was a kid, I was so sensitive to the sunlight that I couldn't really go outside. Like me looking outside during a sunny day would be kind of like you looking at the sun directly to where it would just be completely debilitating to me. So in the same way that um, some you know autistic people, we have too high of a senses in some regions called like a hypersensitivity. We can also have a hypo-sensitivity where you, I, we can't feel things as well. Like I can't really feel pain. I can't really feel hunger. Like I, I can get, probably go like a few days without really feeling any hunger sometimes depending on, you know, how much water I drink and what I ate beforehand. Honestly, at the worst of my depression i was nihilistically depressed probably a few months before the coronavirus i don't i don't have a good timeline on this i yeah. you know i i was in that state of mind i wasn't really recording memories at the time but what i was doing was i was probably sleeping 21 22 hours a day for like i don't know like a year or two what and the only time i would wake wow. up is when you know my mom would call me to help her because she had had a stroke um, a few months before I really lost it and fell into depression. And so while I wasn't taking care of her, I was just sleeping in my bed. I had just completely given up on life and everything. Like it's, it was a really surreal experience because every hour I was conscious, it just felt like my life was slipping away from me. But at the same time, every second just felt so long and agonizing that it was just, it was just so surreal. It was, it just felt impossible. I felt like I was dreaming just all the time. I felt like life was a dream now and that I was already dead. What happened to me was I didn't really, you know, have change. Change kind of happened to me in the way that my sister just came into my room one day and she said, hey, you know, our grandmother's in the hospital and, you know, she might die. Like she's having heart trouble. And I was just like, dang, because my grandmother, she, she tried to give me the love and support that she knew I was missing out on throughout my entire life. And it's just... You know, when she realized that what she needed to do, it was a lot of ways too late. Like she didn't have the resources to, you know, help me get therapy. And she didn't understand like how to help me. But she always tried and she always believed in me. And she always said that like, I believe in you. And she always, you know, tried to talk about she because she used to struggle with her weight for a lot of the same reasons I did. Because um, sexual trauma and other things like that. Just a lot of different terrible coping mechanisms and it hurt me so much that she might die 
you know, hoping that I find a way in life instead of die happy knowing that I did find my way in life. And I just felt so ashamed that I could fail her like that. And that gave me a lot of purpose in my life where I just had nothing. And, you know, I decided that whether she lived or died, I would lose the weight for her. And that's honestly something I needed because I've never been the kind of guy I don't, honestly, I don't care about suffering. You know, we talked before about how I don't really like feel pain or hunger, but to understand that if you don't feel negative emotions, you don't feel positive emotions. Like we have different words for them, at least in English. But if you deny yourself one, you deny yourself the other. And kind of like in the same way, if you've ever heard someone say, nope, don't make me happy, you know, don't make me happy because that will open me up to vulnerability. And so I denied myself that pain because it was just so overbearing. I denied myself everything and I was just, you know, just drifting in nothingness. I didn't feel anything at all. And she opened me back up. She opened me back up to feeling responsibility, to feeling pain. And that helped me. It gave me the start I needed to, to start learning how to cope, learning how to live again in a healthy way for the, like, kind of, it's kind of weird, but she like gave me the chance I needed to help me learn how to live kind of like for the first time, but really, you know, for the second time. So what happened was she was going through heart failure because I believe she had a leaky valve or something. And so what they did is they had um, closed heart surgery or keyhole surgery, where keyhole surgery is where they, the surgeons will make holes in your body for medical instruments instead of opening up your chest cavity and doing open heart surgery. It's a newer kind of surgery. Mm -hmm. And so what they do is, uh, I believe they put in like a replacement valve or something like that, but they credited her survival despite her old age with the fact that she was living a healthy lifestyle and an active lifestyle. And that they said that she probably would have died without that. So she survived and she, she was, um, able to see your progress along the way. Yeah, it was it was pretty pretty messed up because I didn't tell her why I was losing weight until I was, you know, basically done with my weight loss. Like I'd already already lost like so much weight, like over 200 pounds. I forget exactly how much it was, but probably like about about there. Mm -hmm. And so I just came to her and I I described to her the story that I told you. And she just starts crying and said, I wish, you know, you would have told that to me earlier. Mm. And I was just, I didn't do it because I was just so scared of just relapsing or something else happening. And, you know, she was just, she would just feel so heart crushed and disappointed. But obviously that wasn't the right decision. You know, if that did happen and I did relapse into old bad habits, she could have helped me if I would have just communicated to her. That's what my purpose was in losing weight. So aphantasia is the inability to visualize. It's sometimes called a blind mind's eye, where most people, when they close their eyes, they can visualize things, whether it's in black and white, whether it's in color, whether they can remember things they've seen before or just make up completely new images in their head. It's everyone, you know, most people exist on that spectrum. People with aphantasia, they can't get, you know, they can't make any images at all. Some people might see like, you know, blobs of color. Sometimes I see that. Like whenever I'm about to go to sleep, it kind of looks like not an aurora borealis, but kind of like imagine a halfway between a cloud and aurora borealis, just like those colors floating there. Mm -hmm. It's not really majestic, but it's kind of cool. But it's, it's legitimately difficult because of aphantasia. I have a really hard time, you know, distinguishing people. It gave, it gives me facial blindness. Or the inability to, you know, pick somebody out of a crowd that you've seen before. It makes it a lot harder for me. And things I do are just like look at people with like their striking facial features and try to make up like, you know, if there's like a list of five things. If you have five striking features on your face, there's not a very high chance of, you know, you coming up to another person like that and it not being them. And that that's just how I've learned how to cope with that. A lot of people, you know, they can be carried by like their 
their instincts to the point where they don't actually have to learn a lot of skills that could help them. Like to them, they look at it and it's like, you can get 20% better or this could be 20% easier if you invest your time into it. And they're just like, I'm good with it. You know, I can just live where, how I am right now. There's not really a problem with it. And that's their choice. That That's the choice they're given. My choice was you're not going to be able to live at all if you don't figure out how to make this work. Like I had to teach myself how to talk. I couldn't, and I wanted to be able to live that life. I wanted to live something resembling a normal life. And so I had to find a way to make it work. To me, it wasn't a matter of having a slightly easier life. It was a matter of me having a life. So it, this is probably one of like the oldest memories I have. And before I was talking about how I didn't, I couldn't go outside because it was just so bright for me. So I was probably like, it was probably like one year before kindergarten for me. I, so I don't know exactly how old I was. I would say like five, but I couldn't talk at all. And no one thought that was weird because people, you know, guys from the, my mother's side of the family, that's just how they were, that they didn't learn how to talk until they're later in life. I didn't learn until much later in life that that's actually a sign of autism in children. And so I was just like walking around just completely nonverbal. Well, not completely nonverbal. Like if you said something to me or made like a sound, I could repeat it back to you. But that's not talking. That's something called echolalia. So I had a family dog. He was really more of my brother's dog. But because I didn't have anyone else in my life that was really helping me, that my dog was kind of like my father to me. It's, I know that that'll sound very, very kind of weird, but he, he was there for me and he could, really engage with me on a level that I could understand to where I couldn't really communicate with anybody else, but he, like a lot of communication is nonverbal and he's learned from me and I learned how to communicate with him from like a very young age. And so one day, you know, he just approached me and he just, you know, started clawing my hand to ask me if I could go outside. And I was like, uh, okay. And so I take him, you know, put him up on the, on the leash that's connected to the, you know, back porch so I could just let him out. But he just waited for me there. Like he wanted me to come with him. And I was just like, I I, know I can't, you know, it's just too bright for me. And he really helped push me to go outside. And that's, that, that was a real learning curve for me. It's kind of weird how, it's kind of weird to describe how old were you at that time? I was like five, five years old. Okay. It it was so weird to me, but I I learned after like enough of those times how to like dull my perception. Where if it's like really dark, I can still like up. Well, at least whenever I was younger, I haven't done this in a while, but I can like I used to be able to at least up my perception to where if it was really like almost pitch black, I could see a lot better than most people. But I don't know if I still have that. Like a lot of the stuff I used to do as a kid, I've kind of lost access to the ability to do that. I don't know if it's because, you know, if it's like an everybody thing or it's just like I lost it because I didn't keep doing it. Because, I, you know, as I grew up and I made those frameworks, I had less and less reason to do it again. But I, you know, he legitimately helped me learn how to like do that. Even though that wasn't what he was doing, he just wanted to go outside and hang out. But, it was great. Before then, you know, I would hear the other children playing outside and I would just want to go out there with them and like, you know, be able to have friends. That's something I always wanted, like companionship. Mm -hmm. And he, by helping me do that, he gave me the opportunity to legitimately go outside with them. But, you know, I, I was nonverbal. And so I just go out there and they just start making fun of me because I can't talk. And so... I just, you know, cried and came back to my house. I just buried my head into my dog. And I was just like, you know, I felt like I had done something good. I felt like I did the right thing. And those people just looked at me like I was still like, you know, a moron. I was still just a screw up. And so I, I was like, okay, if I want to live a life, I need to learn how to talk. And so I spent probably like the first three or four days making zero progress. I just figured if I concentrated hard enough and thought about words I had like heard other people use enough, I, I would just make it work. 
But then, you know, my dog, he came back to me and, you know, he started clawing my hand, you know, just looking me in the eyes, you know, just trying to lick me in the face. Like he was just like asking if I was all right. Like, are you okay? Because it, I was legitimately acting very weird. He, you know, he made me realize in that moment that what I was doing with him wasn't that different from communicating verbally. Because to me, I had made a big deal about it before. That like me talking and what I did was just completely different. And that helped me find a place to start growing out my knowledge of learning how to talk. Something that really helped me a lot was that, I forget what the actual word for it is, like reconfigured my relationship with trauma. Before, you know, I saw it as something that took away from me. But I kind of reoriented that experience as like a positive like I, I would go through the like legitimately traumatic events in my life. Like they were terribly, they were just terrible. And I would kind of, I would say, how can I make myself better from this situation? And it's like, you know, when I was in kindergarten, I was, you know, I was raped and I kind of took from that. I understand what it's like to be abused, you know, to made to feel inhuman, like an object. And so it helps give me compassion in my life. And finding ways like that to not have trauma destroy you, but to help support you for the rest of your life is something that really helped me. I've tried to overcome trauma in a lot of different ways. That's probably the only way it's ever worked for me personally. Appreciate you all spending a little bit of your time with us today. Thanks for lending an ear. If you guys want to hear this conversation in its entirety, the links are provided right there in the description box. You can check it out. It's broken up into two parts. And if anything you heard today, if it struck a chord, if it resonated with you, drop a line, share your thoughts. Let me know how you feel. Let me know how you're doing. Let me know where you're checking in from. It's about connecting. It's about sharing. It's about building. And that's what we're going to continue to do, putting our best foot forward. We'll be catching up real soon. And before I go, of course, if you would like to be a part of the show and share your story or even a story of someone in your life that has impacted you in a positive way, you can always reach out to me via email. I'd be happy to connect. Until next time and very soon. Peace. Doo -doo -up, doo -doo -up, doo -doo -up. Looking for a sign To know I'm on the right road Ain't seen no sign seen.